Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Skidmore. I'm sitting in for Scott Loveridge, who normally hosts the uh, webinars by the uh, NCRCRD. Um, today's web webinar is entitled Piketty's Capital and Inequality of Income and Wealth, and our guest uh, presenter is Professor Jay Coggins of University of Minnesota. Um, before I go any further, uh, I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Um, if you cannot hear me, um, if you would just put something in the chat section, which is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. It looks like everybody is doing OK. That's great. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, professor Coggins uh, is a university teaching professor in applied economics at the University of Minnesota where he's taught since 1995. He holds a PhD in agriculture and applied economics from Minnesota, as well as a BS in animal science from the University of Wisconsin River Falls. Um, he's published widely on topics uh, ranging from environmental and welfare economics to political economy and inequality. And so the topic um, of today's uh, webinar is inequality. I've been tracking uh, income growth among average families and looking at these changes a little bit. So I'm really looking forward to Jay's presentation. Um, again, if you have any uh, questions um, that you'd like to pose along the way, you can put those in the chat box. And um, Professor Coggins can make note of that and answer them along the way. And if, if he's missing it, then I'll interject at an appropriate time and, and help him take note of those questions. So without further ado, uh, Jay, you're, you're welcome to jump right in. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Mark. It's a terrific opportunity, and welcome, everyone. I want to spend some time today talking about income and wealth inequality and a bit of time talking about Thomas Piketty's bestseller book, Capital. And before we're done, we will have looked at, at least briefly, a variety of ways to measure and understand inequality. But I'd like to start with this picture which is the income distribution itself. No fancy formulas. These are just the data. This is a set of data that shows how the income families are, income is distributed across uh, the distribution. And it's from a micro simulation data that this Brookings Tax Policy Center did a few years ago. It's uh, 160 million taxpaying units. The uh, a taxpaying unit is any who files a 1040 form. If you file jointly, you're one. If you file singly, you're two. There are 160 million of these in the country. The first blue bar on the left is at about 18 million. That means 18 million people who filed a 1040 form had income less than $10,000 that year. The second bar is 23 point something million people filed a tax return showing somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars. This is gross income before any adjustments. Another 19 million with 20 to 30 and so on. As this moves to the right, income is going up until you see off to the right side. Very few people made between 390 and 400 thousand dollars, for example. The median of all these 160 million is about 42 thousand dollars. Half are below, the other half are above. The 95% mark 200,000 or so, that's the red vertical bar. And far off to the right, you see another red line. That's the 99% mark. And it's almost exactly at 500,000, meaning 1% of people units made more money that year than $500,000. Now, when I use this, show, this slide in a public lecture, this screen, the, this picture would be projected on a screen in front of the room and I pull out a measuring tape and hold it up against my chart and it will be five or six feet wide and then I ask this question you see one percent of people are to the right of the chart how wide would it have to be to have room on it for everyone the highest income in America in 2013 according to Forbes was George Soros who they estimate made four billion dollars in that year to get him on our chart, how wide would it have to be? Well, your screens are all probably different sizes, but in mine, this chart is about eight and a quarter inches wide. And I did the algebra, the, the arithmetic, to figure out how many feet, and then 
how many miles that would be. This chart would have to be 5,500 feet wide to have room on it for George Soros. That's a mile, which is about five of these ships. This is the Tregurtha, the biggest boat on the Great Lakes right now. It can just barely fit into the harbor at Duluth. Meanwhile, 80 million people are below $42,000, and on my screen, that's just about half an inch. You see, that's inequality. All right, well, one of my main points here will be to demonstrate some facts. And, oh, I'm seeing some things in the chats here. Are any of these for me? No, okay. Um, I'm going to try to pay attention to this chat box in the corner in case you have questions. I like to main, mention, though, that I'm not against markets. In fact, I believe there's got to be an equality in an economy like ours. I'm not against inequality. The question that I think is interesting is how much is too much? And are we at a point now where it's something we should worry about? And my feeling is, although economists spend a lot of time thinking about and measuring inequality, we're not ex especially qualified to decide how much of it is too much. That's really a moral question. But my feeling is I like to get the facts out so people can think about th this question using the best information. Now, for the first half of what I want to say, the question I'm trying to get at is, what do people mean by inequality? People like the President of the United States use this word and give speeches claiming that their focus is on inequality. I don't think Barack Obama knows the many, many ways to measure inequality. He uses this word. What does he mean by it? Or the new governor of, of Rhode Island who made the statement about inequality is the biggest problem we face just last month. Well. Um, here's one way that economists think about inequality, using a Lorenz curve. That's the red curve in this figure. Now, this is a little bit esoteric. I'm going to try to explain it briefly, and maybe we'll have some questions later. This is an income accumulation curve, or a cumulative income curve. Here's how it works. Take a, suppose we have a population of a million people. Uh, order them from the poorest to the richest, the lowest to the highest income. And then begin, start at the bottom, the poorest people, and start adding their incomes together. Along this red curve, by the time we get to point two, that would be 20% of the people added up, and they would have something just a couple percent of the income. By the time we get to point six, that means we've taken 60% of the people in our population, 600,000, and now they have something close to 20% of the income, maybe. At the 80% mark, maybe they have a third of the income. This red curve is rising in that way. At the 90% mark here, 90% of the people would have about half of the income. The top 10% would have the other half. OK, we can come back to this if people have questions. A Gini coefficient is easy to explain, maybe not so easy to compute sometimes if you have a lot of data. It's just the area A divided by area A plus B, which is the triangle. As, we have, as inequality goes down, this curve will shift. But the Gini coefficient can be 0. That would be if the income were perfectly equal. Or it can be 1, if one person has all the income, both unreasonable, of course. But we can compare two income distributions. This blue curve is another Lorenz curve, and it's less unequal. The area A is smaller, so Gini would be much smaller. And the number for the United States economy, according to the Census Bureau, is about 0.48. Pretty high number. We'll see how we compare to others. Here I just threw in some ways that economists think about inequality. There are many, many measures, some of them complicated, some less complicated. The question I'm getting at is which one does Obama have in mind when he uses the word inequality? Well, I have an opinion about this, and let's see if I can convince you. I don't think he's talking about the Gini coefficient. This chart shows how the Gini coefficient has changed over the past 50 years. The break is because the question in their survey changed in 1993. We can look at the numbers since then, and this has hardly budged. It went from 0.46 in 1993 to 0.48 in 2012. I don't think this is a dangerous growing trend. If this was all we knew about inequality, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be talking about it. 
nobody would be interested. I don't think Obama was talking about poverty either. This chart shows poverty as the Census Bureau computes it again. The top panel is number of people in poverty since 1960. The bottom is the rate of poverty. The way this works just quickly is for any size family, the Census Bureau computes a dollar figure and says anybody in a household for four people, two parents and two kids, by, for example, that threshold is $23,700. A family of four with income less than that is in poverty. All four of them are. 15% of Americans live in households with that much income or less. The thing is, this rate is about what it was in 1993. There's no dangerous growing trend here. There's a lot of misery in this figure. But I don't think there's a trend. Average income, the mean in red here, is rising faster than the median income in blue. And the mean is always going to be above the median because George Soros is way over there pulling up the mean. But the median, by the way, for households, the median household income in the US is about 50,000 just above that here. Um, that's not influenced by where George is. He's way above the median. But the point is this gap is growing, but not very fast. We can compare ourselves to other countries. Our Gini coefficient, according to the OECD, the Organiz Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, is about 0.38. That's interesting partly because they're taking taxes out and adding in government benefits in the way of Social Security and health care and unemployment insurance and so on. Doing all of that takes our Gini coefficient from 0.48, that's the census number based on raw income, down to 0.38. What's interesting here is we're almost at the top of the list. Only Turkey, Mexico, and Chile have higher numbers of all of these developed countries. The OECD also compute poverty. They do it at a little bit different too. They just say, how many people live in households with income less than half of the median? Again, our median is 50. Half of that is 25. They say 17% of Americans live in poverty, according to this number. We're almost at the top of this list. Chile, Turkey, Mexico, and Israel beat us. We have plenty of inequality compared to countries like us. But my story is that what we know about poverty and the reason we care about it is really due to these two guys who have revolutionized how we think about and understand inequality. They're two French economists who spent a little bit of time together at MIT 20 years ago now. Piketty is at Paris and Saez is at Berkeley. They've been working 20 years together to understand inequality. And what they did is went to the IRS and got all the tax return data from the US IRS. Their project has now expanded to many other countries, but their main focus is getting the best information on the richest people in every country they can. Before they came along, almost everyone who studied inequality worked with survey data, like the Census Bureau or the Federal Reserve's Survey of Consumer Finances. And there's a serious problem with data like this, and that is, Rich people don't reply to the survey. It's a well-known problem that the, it's impossible to get a good sample from the top. And that means any measure of inequality, including the Census Bureau's number, will be biased downward. You need to know as much as you can about that top tail and the Census Bureau doesn't. However, the IRS does because you can't just not file a tax return. The IRS data aren't perfect, of course. But the big advantage to the data that Sayas and Piketty have is that they have everyone at the top. By the way, I think we can make these slides available and all my references and so on will be included here so you can go to their top incomes database and, and look around. The point I'm making is if these two people hadn't done what they've done, they, we wouldn't know inequality is a problem. We would be looking at those Gini charts where nothing is changing. But in fact, something is changing. And I'm convinced that this is what Obama was talking about. This is what the new Rhode Island governor was talking about. When non-specialists, politicians, pundits, and so on talk about inequality, they're referring to this curve. This is the Piketty and Sayo series of the top 1% income share in the United States, which starts in 1913 because that's the first year of the modern day income tax. They got all these data for every year from the, from the IRS and computed this number. This series includes capital gains income, by the way. 
you, you can see that in 1928, this number peaked at 24%. 1% of people, 24% of income. Oh, and then the Depression hit, the Second World War hit, and this plunged from 24 down to 10% and then 9% and stayed there for about a third of a century in the middle part of the last century. And then something changed around 1980. It's remarkable how many indicators of inequality shifted and just changed dramatically in 1980 or thereabouts. And since then, the trend has been relentlessly upward. I think this is what Obama meant. In 2007, the number got back to 23.8. Never quite broke the record. It's volatile because of capital income being pretty volatile. That, I think, is what people mean by inequality. Oh, and we, compare, we can compare ourselves to other countries, too. These are just three other countries, Japan, France, and Australia. And these are numbers of top 1% share without capital gains. They don't have capital gains income for these other countries. What's interesting, I think, about this figure is, first, Australia never had a very high top share income. I don't know why that is. But Japan and France did. They were a lot like us. Japan in brown, France in green, U.S. in red. Back in 1930, they were a lot like the United States. And their number fell, just like ours did. By the end of the Second World War, they were like us, below 10%. And they stayed right with us for those next 30 years or so. And then around 1980, when our top 1% share began to rise dramatically, the Japan and France numbers rose ever so slightly. And the reason I find this interesting is because many people trying to understand and explain inequality use the following two explanations. They're by far the most popular. One is globalization, and the other is computers, technical change, that puts a premium on people with high technical skills. But my response to that is, then why didn't it happen in France? They face a global economy. Why didn't it ha happen in Japan, where they have plenty of computers and robots and so on? I think the answer is those two don't explain it. There's other things going on that have to do with decisions we make as a society regarding wages and unions and taxes and so on. And we have made choices that have helped drive our top 1% share upward. France and Japan made different choices. Now, what's radical about the Piketty and Sayers number, this 1% income share, is that it's based on one dot on the Lorenz curve. Most other people, up until they came along, would have been worried about the area A and the entire red curve. Piketty and Sayers say, I don't care about that. We don't care about that. All we want to know is where the 1% income share, and that's what they call inequality. But it's a little funny because you could do a lot to reduce inequality. You could take the 99% and take all of their money and divide it up equally. And the 1% share wouldn't change at all. But the Gini coefficient would change dramatically. This blue line would represent the portion of the Lorenz curve between 0 and 0.99 if we equalized income for all those people. That would be a huge reduction in inequality, right? Uh, well, but the Piketty and Sayers 1% measure wouldn't budge. They have a totally different conceptualization, a different way of measuring inequality. Um, I guess I've already said that. Okay. So that's my first point. These guys changed everything. My second point is a very quick summary of this book, which I recommend, but I recommend that you plan to spend a while at it. It's 570 pages or so, and it's heavy, heavy going. But uh, I think it's well worth your effort. He's taken these data that he and Sayas and their team have put together and turn it into a historical account of inequality going back centuries for many countries, and also an analysis of what's going to happen. Now, it, it just it turns out that last week, a week and a half ago now, the Economics Association had their big annual conference, and Piketty was featured in a big prominent session where three people got up and complained about his book, and he then was able to respond to it. And in starting his 
lecture, he said three main facts that he wanted people to take away from his book. The first is inequality was higher in Europe 100 years ago. It's higher in America now. Here's his figure. This is figure 9.8 in the book. Red is the US, blue is Europe. This is the top 10% income share in these places. Europe is a, a subset of countries, Germany, France, UK, Italy, Sweden. The 10% richest Americans take home almost half of the income. 10% of people, 48% of income. In Europe, it's 35. Ours is almost a half, theirs is about a third. His fact number two, wealth inequality is always a lot higher than income inequality. And that's true. And a big part of the story of his book is how increasing concentration of wealth is producing increasing concentration of inequality. These are the comparable figures for wealth in the US and Europe. Again, top 10% shares, red US, blue Europe. The same switch, they had more in concentration 100 years ago, we have more now, but the 10% the shares are lower for both than they were in 1900. Here's a comparison of the US top 10% wealth share in red and US top 10% income share in blue. This is his second fact. Wealth is more concentrated. Third is that wealth inequality is less extreme today than it used to be, but the capitalization of private wealth is almost back where it was. Here's what he means. This ratio of wealth to income plays a huge part in the, in the book. He calls it beta. And here's how you think, should think about this. Wealth is the value of all the stuff out there. Buildings, land, machines, cars, intellectual property, patents, and so on. Financial assets, Wall Street, stocks, and bonds. That's in the trillions, of course. Income here is GDP in a country for a year, pretty much. If you divide capital by income, you get his number in years. Namely, how many years of, if we used all of our income to replace capital, how many years of GDP would it take? 400 means four years. That's a percent. His point is that 100 years ago in Europe, all the wealth was worth almost seven times GDP. Then during the war, two wars, the value of capital in, you, in, in Europe plunged because so much capital was destroyed. But now that blue curve with the squares has risen back up to almost six years of data, 600%. That means capital six times GDP, whereas the US figure has been more constant and we're just barely over four years. This beta is a huge part of the book. There are four other numbers, though, symbols. In this whole 600-page book, there are really six symbols. One is alpha, the share of income that comes, that is captured by owners of capital by virtue of owning capital. The rest of income goes to labor. Beta is this capital income ratio. R is the rate of return on capital. S is the savings rate of all of the income in a year, how much of it gets saved instead of spent on consumption. And G is the growth rate of national income, GDP growth, really. Five symbols is really the extent of the math in this book. And yet he's got three laws built up from these five symbols. One is that alpha is R times B. The rate of return, sorry, the, the share of all income going to capital is just the rate of return to capital, like 5%, times this beta, the capital income ratio of 6. In this case, alpha would be 30%. 70% of income would go to labor. The second law, in the long run, beta is S, the savings rate, divided by the growth rate of the economy. If S is 12, G is 2, then beta is 6. And finally, this famous inequality, which he calls the central contradiction of capitalism. He says, as long as the rate of return to capital is bigger than the growth rate of the economy, there will be this spiral of increasing concentration of income, of wealth and also income among a handful of the wealthy people in the economy. And this is what worries him. Here's the story of the book in sort of one little paragraph. He says, it's always been true throughout history, almost always, that R has been bigger than G. 
Centuries ago, G was almost zero. There was no growth. And growth, by the way, includes population growth. Whereas R, the return to owning capital, which 500 years ago was mostly banned, was 4 or 5% through most of history. And there's been a lot of inequality for all that time. There was one exception in history. He says it was from 1910 to 1950 when R fell below G. A bunch of capital got destroyed. The return to capital was much smaller. And inequality fell, this top share inequality. But now we're back to where R is bigger than G again, and it's going to remain that way, and we'll be right back to the kind of aristocratic societies with a handful of rich elite, and that's the future we face, this dystopic future. Oh, and he has a solution towards the end of the book. He, writes, uh, he tells us that um, he wants to see a capital tax that is harmonized internationally, so you can't shelter your income in the Bahamas or Switzerland, and that is progressive. So if your fortune is a million, you pay one rate. If it's a billion, you pay another rate. If it's 20 billion, you pay even more. This is a capital tax every year, like the property tax on your house. This figure is the central feature of the book. And in the early reviews back in April and May, almost everyone published this figure 10.10. .10. And it's a remarkable thing. First notice that the years are along the horizontal axis. It starts in the year zero. And it goes out to 2100. The black dots are the return to capital R. The open squares are G. And he's saying here that R has always been bigger than G, typically by a lot, except during part of the 20th century. And in the future, we'll see R bigger than G again. OK. There are some controversial parts about this book. One is the alpha, the first law is not. The second law is, mostly because S isn't fixed. It's not constant. The third, though, is really controversial. I'm going to do this quickly, and then we'll see what kind of questions people have. I've pretty much run to the end of my time, but let me quickly go through it. There are two controversies regarding this R bigger than G. One is, is it, can it be true? And the other is, if it's true, does it meet, mean inequality will go up? Um, can it be true over long stretches? Well, standard growth models in economics really can't answer this question. But the intuition seems like it must be wrong. And here's what I mean. If R is bigger than G, it means there will be more and more capital, because it's growing faster than the economy. But as we have more and more capital, the price of capital, the return to capital, should fall, right? That's a natural check on R. But Piketty says, well, no, that's not how it's happened. A lot of people are now trying to answer this question. It's something we don't know much about. Piketty's got the data. If R is bigger than G, does it mean higher inequality? Well, Robert Solow is a very famous economist who won a Nobel Prize for his growth model. And he himself has praised this book, saying he thinks Piketty is right. A lot of other people think Piketty is wrong. R bigger than G should be a good thing. But again, there's very little clear about this question in anywhere in economics. Um, the solution is controversial. I'm going to skip through some of this and show you Piketty's main argument against a consumption tax, which many people have proposed as a better solution than Piketty's wealth tax. He says a consumption tax won't do the job. And the reason is it's so hard to identify what consumption is. Does Bill Gates get to count his expenditure, expenditure on his private jet or not. He says billionaires consume power and influence. They spend millions on political campaigns. Does that count as consumption? Or is it just their food and their clothing and maybe their car? Billion, billionaires can consume politicians, he says. They consume journalists. And sometimes they consume academics. Will the tax apply to that expenditure? His main point is he doesn't think a consumption tax will work very well. I'm going to leave you with one last thought. I think this is the most provocative, interesting assessment of the book I've ever seen. And this is by a, an economist at Stanford in a paper last month. And he's saying Piketty is forcing us to think about new ideas and new possibilities. The book doesn't have all the answers, but he's leading the way. And now let's all get busy and help him work out how to think about these things. Okay, I'm going to stop there, just a couple minutes over. And I look forward to your questions.
Well, thank you, Jay. Um, I know that some of uh, the audience may need to leave. Um, we try to hold these to about 20 minutes to a half an hour, um, but I I wonder if there's anybody out there who would like to stay for a few minutes longer and ask a question via the chat. And um, while we're waiting for the chat, um, I one of the questions I've been thinking about, Jay, is um, the interaction between uh, monetary policy and the credit debt and credit expansion that we've experienced in the Western world over the past uh, 30 or 40, 30, 30, 35, 40 years or so that has fueled um, relative increases in asset prices relative to um, goods and services. So, um, and, and how that may contribute to the inequality question. So maybe I'll start with that question, and then um, if any of, of who are able to stay have a question, you could do it in your chat chat set section there on the lower sure. left. Well, you, you've started off with a doozy of a question, Mark, and I'm not going to pretend to have the answers to that one. What I'll say is that um, a couple things. One is Piketty recognizes very well that the prices of assets, and especially financial assets, matter hugely. Not only financial assets, but real estate too. Real estate is an enormous part of the capital base in the country, in, in, all, of, in all of the world, especially Europe and the US. And he is not really accounting well for those different prices, and especially the pr prices that change over time, prices of capital, prices of stocks and bonds and so on. And he's certainly not accounting for macroeconomic policy, whether it's fiscal or monetary. So I think it's fair to say that he's really not getting at how monetary and fiscal policy affect inequality. And he's not even really doing a very good job of explaining the different the changes in asset prices over time. So he's measuring capital and he's measuring income. Uh, but income is measured based on tax returns. And there, I guess, the IRS has to trust people to decide how much their portfolios are worth and so on. So I, I don't think he's making a big, big argument based on that, that consideration. OK, thank you. Um, we see a, I have an, another question in the, in the chat section there, Jay, um, from Steve Deller at University of Wisconsin. I don't, I don't know if you'd like to read that and respond. Can to everyone it. see the question? Okay. I believe Upward so. Upward mobility overrides concerns about inequality. Well, this is another area that is now getting renewed attention and a lot of attention in just in the past few years. The, uh, uh, the response that a lot of people who don't think inequality is a problem or for sure don't want to see anything done about it, uh, such people respond by saying, well, there's there might be inequality, but there's also a lot of mobility. And so everyone gets their chance to be rich sometime during their lifetime. And that's the American dream. The equality of opportunity is what matters. Um, and my own view of that is, we don't have time to go into it much, but my view is that as more and more evidence comes in and people use more and more elaborate data sets and more sophisticated methods to try to account for changes in uh, who gets rich in each generation or over time? I think inequality, or, sorry, mobility is falling in this country and it's lower than it is in countries that we think of as being like us, namely most of Europe, Japan, Canada, and so on. So I don't think mobility is much of a solution to this problem. There's an awful lot of chronic poverty that lasts over multiple generations. That's what I worry about. I think Jerry's question um, sort of highlights your, your response. Do you have a, an additional response? To well, Jerry? I think people do perceive that mobility is high, especially those at the top. Um, and <laughs> I just don't think it's very true. And so a big part of my mission when I speak about inequality publicly is just to help people understand the data. And when I give a longer lecture, I do feature mobility and the the results there are pretty dismal, too, in my judgment. There just isn't much um, mobility, and there's an awful lot of chronic intergenerational poverty. 
I, I see you have a couple more questions coming in now. The, the first one is from Lori. Yeah, this is a terrific question. Does immigration reduce inequality? Um, this is a question that is not very well answered in the literature, although people are working on it now. And some of the most recent findings that I've read, um, I could get some of this to you, Lori, are starting to say that inequality is not much affected by immigration and people do this across counties and so on and say and and find out whether Gini coefficients by county are affected much by the number of immigrants legal or illegal in that county and it turns out not to do as much to, it doesn't do much to inequality and that's partly because it drags drags down incomes up a, into the distribution aways uh, but this is an effect that people do not have a good handle on, and uh, I would be lying if I tried to say that I know much about it either. I don't think any of us do. Oh, why should inequality be reduced? My point is I don't think there's an economic, uh, I don't think there's a reason in economic principles to be worried about inequality. I, I can't think of one. Maybe Steve Deller can help us think of one, but my that's why I'm firmly convinced it's strictly an ethical question or a moral question. What's fair? Uh, what, what's, a, what's the moral way to organize a society? Well, uh, one, one argument that I have heard made, Jay, is that if, you, if the income equality becomes too great, you you stand a chance of encountering social stability, which um, can lead to great economic inefficiency. Um, you know, di disequilibrium, disruptions, and things like that. So there might be that kind of argument you could make. Yes, one can make that argument. I think uh, essentially that's a political argument that if we aren't we're, if we aren't careful about inequality, it can lead to disruption in the po political order. Um, to me, that is predominantly a political decision. Capital destruction mm -hmm. as well. Yes, yeah, so and people make arguments about how growth is affected and, and so on. Um, in the end, I think those arguments are sort of missed the point. This is my opinion. And to me, it's a moral question. And an argument based on, for example, too much inequality will reduce growth. Well, what if there's very little evidence on this question in either direction? What if the answer is no, it doesn't affect growth? And does that mean unlimited inequality is okay? These are very tricky questions. I see Jim Rezek has another question. Oh, uh, yeah, there's, there's almost no evidence that I think is reliable to, to back up what Reich is saying here, um, the idea that inequality caused the depression, I just don't know of any evidence that that's true. Forecasting the future is very difficult. And too, too many things determine the depression, bubbles and all sorts of things. Um, I don't think depression can be said to be caused by inequality. Well, this is the argument about growth from David. Um, and, and I find it convincing. I just don't know of any good data, uh, empirical work to, to uh, establish this. The idea is poor people spend all their money, rich people save a lot of their money, and as more and more money is captured by rich people, less of it is getting spent, and so there's a, a rundown in demand, and that leads to stagnation in the economy. That paragraph makes a lot of sense. And there's a part of me thinks, of course, it has to be true. Um, it's just that there's very little evidence that people have been able to bring into a, a st an econometric study of, of economic history to establish that that's going on. Economies are too complicated to really isolate effects cleanly in that way. Well, I think that's, yeah, I think it's true. That's certainly an important point that Piketty is making in his book, that more and more inequality will lead to um, political instability. Look, this guy is French. 
and a lot of his book is about the, the <laughs> French economy and French history, and he re has read a lot about the French Revolution, and he's convinced that that's a possible future for his country. Um, and I tend to think he's probably right. It could happen. Ah. Well, I, uh, I I see that some are starting to 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 go, and we've run a, a little bit over just to give chan a chance for people to um, ask questions. Maybe we can take this last question from Jan, and then if you have re remaining interactions you'd like to have, you could send an email to Jay or something like that. Um, so I see this last question from from Jan. Jay, would you like to? Um, I'll that have one? it. Does yeah, this is a terrific question again. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to find the best and the greatest and the newest evidence uh, that I can regard as sort of supporting my view of the world. I'm worried about inequality. Um, and so I like it when I find evidence that I should worry about things like <clears throat> inequality caused a huge uh, recession, great recession in the American economy. And I just don't think there's any good evidence of that at all. Um, yes, there was a bubble. Yes, there was a lot of speculation. Yes, housing prices were too high. And then, yes, inequality was also high leading up to the 2008-2009 uh, meltdown. But saying inequality caused that, I know of no evidence that, that uh, really t uh, nails that down. If you know of some, please send it along. Well, <laughs> well, I, I think maybe now is a good time to 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 stop for uh, today. I'd like to thank all the um, participants for joining in and taking some time for uh, the discussion. Um, and thank you, Jay, for um, helping us understand what what Piketty had to say and um, and helping us think about income inequality, which I agree is also important and I'm not sure that we any of us really know how to think about it fully. well mark mark so thank, thank you me. very much I appreciate the opportunity Steve Deller I think was responsible for engineering this chance for me and I appreciate it Steve thanks to everyone thank you um, while we close and people sign off um, Jay, one, I, I ran across a, an interesting study by uh, political scientists, one at Northwestern and the other, I think, at Princeton, and they evaluated thousands of uh, federal laws and, and, and changes in statutes and tried to correlate those changes with the preferences of different classes of people. And what they concluded was is that independently sort of the median or the average person had almost no independent influence on uh, the laws and the changes in the laws that we have but rather it was the really the top income earners that really uh, influenced changes in policy at least at the federal level um, and so I, I I wonder if you might respond to that well I I mean my main response is I'm not a political scientist <laughs> But yes, I have read some some about that, and I, I think it's true that the, the amount of money in politics has certainly made it harder for the median person to be the decisive voter or the decisive influencer of political outcomes. I, I worry about that, but I'm no expert. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you, everyone. I think it's, uh, we'll sign off Thanks very there. much. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.